Welcome everyone to the training series, Fundamentals or Machine Learning for Earth Science. This is part one of the three-part series, an overview of machine learning. Before we get started, I wanted to introduce myself and the NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, or RSET. My name is Brock Blevins. I am a training coordinator for the RSET program, and I will be your host for this training. NASA's Applied Remote Sensing Training Program's goal is to empower the global community to incorporate Earth observing data into environmental management and decision making. Our trainings are designed for professionals in the public, public and private sector, environmental managers, researchers, policymakers, and we offer these trainings in the application themes of agriculture, climate, disasters, health and air quality, land management, and water resources management. Our set training availability. We offer trainings online in a webinar series such as we are starting today. We offer self-paced trainings and custom in-person trainings. All training is cost-free to the participants. There are often a bilingual option, typically in Spanish. And to meet the diversity of needs and skill levels from a global audience, we, we offer trainings from introductory to advanced. And as always, all the materials are free to use and adapt. We only ask that you give attribution or credit to NASA RCEP. At the end of this training, we aim for participants to be able to recognize the most common machine learning method used in processing earth science data, to describe the benefits and the limitations of machine learning, explain how to apply basic machine learning algorithms and techniques in a meaningful manner, use analysis appropriate training data sets to evaluate conditions and solutions for a given case study, and complete basic procedures to interpret, refine, and evaluate the accuracy of the results of machine learning analysis. As this is an introductory webinar series, there are not many prerequisites coming into the training today. We do suggest that participants have an understanding of the fundamentals of remote sensing, concepts and terminology. You can do so by viewing our session one of the on-demand fundamentals of remote sensing series, or if you already have equivalent experience, that's not necessary, but please feel free to uh, review if you like. Attendees will need to access a Google Drive and Google Colab um, to work with the code here today. So in order to access those resources, users must use an email ending in gmail.com. So you just have to have a, a gmail.com account. We'll have a video of the demonstration shown today available within 48 hours on the training webpage. So you are able to go through this process at your own pace. Here's a schedule for each of the three part training that we'll cover from April 20th through May 4th. There'll be one homework associated with the series and that'll be made available on May 4th. It'll be due on April 19th. And this will be a Google form submission. Throughout this presentation, please feel free to type your questions for the trainers in the questions section. All the questions that are being asked will be moved over to a Q&A document, and you'll be able to view all the questions and answers at the end of this presentation during our Q&A session in a document, and then we also answer those audibly. And we'll also provide this Q&A document as a resource, as a PDF, and we'll put that on our training webpage uh, within a week. We just need to clean it up for accuracy, and you're able to obtain that from there. So now I will hand this off to our first tra trainer today, Jordan Caraballo Vega, to introduce us to part one. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending today. We're going to be talking about some of the fundamentals of machine learning for earth science. The part one is going to be an overview of some of these algorithms and some of the applications. So we have the instructor team. We have Jordan Caraballo Vega, which is myself. We have Mark Curl, which is our lead of the data science group at GSFC. We have Jules Cacho at GSFC as well. We have Gian Lee, and we have Caleb Spratlin, which also works for the data science group. 
the outlines for today's session, we're going to first look at an overview of machine learning, some of the fundamentals and basic concepts. We're going to then look at the importance of machine learning targeted towards earth science and some of the applications that support this. We're going to see how usable machine learning algorithms are for remote sensing data. We're going to discuss some of the software that supports some of these machine learning algorithms. We're going to talk about some of the applications in detail. And then we're going to have a single hands-on experiment just to use Google Code App and then load and visualize some of the data. After this, we're going to have a post-session assignment that we're going to briefly discuss. And then we can proceed with the Q&A session. For all of the three sessions that we're going to discuss, we have this GitHub repository. We're going to have the resources and all of the materials that you can use later on after the session is done. The objectives of today, after participating in this training, attendees will be able to recognize the most common machine learning methods used for processing earth science data. They're going to be able to describe the benefits and limitations of machine learning for earth science analyses. And they're going to be able to explain how to apply some of these basic machine learning algorithms and techniques in a meaningful manner for remote sensing data. Jules, please take it over. In 1959, Arthur Samuel introduced the concept of machine learning with the following quote. Machine learning enable the machine to automatically learn from data, improve performance from experiences, and predict things without being explicitly programmed. Machine learning can be understood as computational methods that use experience to improve performance or make accurate prediction. In this case, experience refer to past information or data that is available to us. As with any computational exercise, the quality and amount of the data will be crucial to the accuracy of the prediction that will be made. The major focus of machine learning is to extract information from data automatically by computational and statistical method. How does machine learning work? The following diagram gives us some kind of overview of the main step of machine learning. And in the following slide, we are going to go into more details. A machine learning algorithm can be seen as a mathematical function containing many free parameters, thousands, even millions, that take input that we'll call features and map those features into one or more output that we'll call also target. The process of training a machine learning algorithm involves optimizing the free parameters to map the features to the target accurately. New input data that we'll call the test data is fed into the machine learning algorithm to test whether the method works correctly. The prediction and result are then checked against each other. A numerical score is then calculated. If the prediction and result don't match well, the method is retrained multiple times until the data scientists get the desired outcome. This enables the machine learning method to continually learn on its own and produce the optimal answer gradually, increasing in accuracy over time. Now, here are the basic simplified steps of machine learning. First of all, you need to state the problem. You need to gather and then gather the data. And after that, you have to do some kind of data pre-processing. It's important to mention that this data pre-processing, it might be the most important step of machine learning. People believe that 80% of the time need to spend on data processing. And we are going to see in session number two, when we are going to learn about exploratory data analysis, is where really the focus will be on. After that, we need to go to the process of, tra uh, uh, to, of training the model. The data set connects the algorithm and the method leverages sophisticated math mathematical modeling to learn and develop prediction. When the model is trained, 
we need to go to the, the process of testing the model. We use a test set to check the model's accuracy. And finally, the last step, we need to improve, review the model result, reconsider the methods selected. We make adjustments by changing some kind of parameters and see if you can improve the performance. Sometimes small adjustments have a significant impact. Machine learning algorithm. There are two broad categories of machine learning methods relevant in most L science applications. The first one, supervised learning. It involves presenting a machine learning method with many examples of input-output pairs, called the training set. Can be further divided according to the type of target that is being learned. Has either categorical, this means that we deal with classific a classification problem, or continuous and will deal with a regression problem. Like, for instance, the temperature at a given location on Earth. The model is trained with labeled data set, which allow the model to learn and grow more accurate over time. The second category, unsupervised learning. In this particular category, algorithms are not given a particular target to predict. Rather, an algorithm task is to learn the natural structure to identify pattern or trend in the data set without being told what structure it is. Here, the model looks for patterns in unlabeled data. A third category, reinforcement learning, is not commonly used in earth science. Here, the model trains machine to trials and error to take the best action by establishing a reward system. Big data in earth science. The amount of data from observation and output model is exploding. The data is characterized as being massive multi-source, heterogeneous, multi-temporal, multi-scalar, highly dimensional, highly complex, non-stationary, and unstructured. Our ability to collect and create data far out, out spaces, our ability to sensibly assimilate it, let alone understand it. To get the most out of the explosive growth and diversity of Earth system data, we face at least two major tasks, extracting knowledge and insight from the large and complex collection of data and deriving models that learn much more from data than traditional data assimilation approaches can, while still respecting our evolving understanding of nature's laws. Machine learning is now a successful part of several research-driven and operational geoscientific processing schemes addressing the atmosphere, the land surface, and the ocean, and has co-evolved with data availability. Machine learning in earth science. I like this, this quote that was uh, written in an article in 2021 that shows the importance of machine learning in geoscience for research and training. Basically, the goal here is to show how critical it is to do some research to provide funding in machine learning and also to train people in how to use machine learning algorithm in earth science. And that is the goal of this the particular training that we are having today. Machine learning has been applied to many domains in earth science. We can mention, for instance, land cover and land use classification, precipitation and soil moisture estimation, 
cloud processes representation in climate models, crop type detection and crop yield prediction, estimation of water, carbon and energy fluxes between the land and atmosphere, spatial downscaling of satellite observations, ocean turbulence modeling, tropical cyclone and intensity estimation. There are many other domain where machine learning can be applied in earth science. How machine learning is applied in earth science. An illustration of model-driven and data-driven method. On the left are the research topic in, let's say, in earth science. On the right, we have the observations. In the middle are examples of model-driven and data-driven method. In model-driven method, the principle of geophysical phenomena are induced from a large amount of observed data based on physical causality. Then the models are used to deduct the geophysical phenomena in the future or in the past. This approach can be limited by the difficulties of finding patterns where we don't expect them. In data-driven method, the computer first induct a regression or classification model without considering physical causality. Then this model will perform tasks such as classification on incoming data set. The use of machine learning here can help us discover patterns and trends buried between vast volume of data that are not apparent of human are not apparent to human analysis. Machine learning technique learn relationship among physical parameters from broad input and output data in contrast to traditional or physical modeling method in which modeler explicitly account for those relationships when they set up a model. So in the next session, I will be talking about the benefit of utilizing machine learning in earth science. This machine learning application became very popular in the industry about a decade ago. NASA scientists also quickly realized that such technology can greatly accelerate the scientific researchers in many aspects. I just point out a few examples here. First of all, using machine learning tools can increase the efficiency of processing and analyzing large amount of data. Every day, NASA collects tons of data by observing our Earth and outer space, and such amount of data increasing every second. It's a big challenge to process those data in a traditional way. But we can use some machine learning algorithm to simplify and automate analysis such complex data sets. Secondly, machine learning algorithms have proved its capability to identify the objects, patterns, and the relationships in complex data sets. Sometimes it can provide insights that that's even difficult for, to be identified by our human eyes. And those insights often leading to a new discoveries. Last but not least, we can apply machine learning algorithms to, to the areas where we are lack, lack of observations and making predictions over there. Or in some cases, we can even use machine learning algorithms to replace physical models and make better predictions of Earth science phenomena. I will provide two use cases among many in the following slides. The first use case is uh, to NASA scientists use machine learning algorithms to identify new stars and the star systems. The, uh, the data was collected by an instrument called the transiting Explanate Survey Satellite Test. In short, the satellite was launched in April 2018. The mission is to search for planets outside our solar systems, including those planets that's suitable for life. 
and the uh, test satellite collecting tons of data uh, every day and allow scientists to view the amount of optical lights arriving from the stars over time. It was called light curves. But it also provides a challenge because it's nearly impossible to thoroughly investigate the terabytes of astronomic, astronomical data to find rare phenomena such as multiple star systems. But NASA scientist Brian Paul and his colleagues have developed and leveraged a set of machine learning and high performance computing tools. Therefore, they can quickly extract more than 60, 60 million light curves for, for further investigations. And based on those uh, filtered uh, light curves, NASA astronomers have identified more than 50 more than 50 planet candidates and more than 200 potential binary star systems and more than 10 potential triple star system and 20 potential quadruple star systems and uh, even uh, one potential sextuple star systems and uh, to be clear all those discoveries are new. That means we, human beings, have never identified such solar systems and plan, planet previously. The second example I provide here is a cooperation between NASA Goddard Center and the Millennial Challenge Corporation (MCC). One of the goal of this cooperation is to investigate in uh, agriculture development projects to empower local. Uh, farmers and uh, to come back with uh, food insecurity. And uh, research scientists use Sentinel-2 remote sensing data and in situ observations uh, to train uh, five different random forest model to estimate crop types and crop yield across the study uh, region of uh, Burkina Faso. And it's turned out the model shows more than 88% accuracy on crop types and 60% on crop use during the 2019 rainy season. And uh, accuracy dropped slightly to 64% and 53% re uh, respectively during the 2019 dry seasons. But it provides impressive uh, accuracy to predict uh, crop type for year 2020 dry season, it, ha it, it has a 60% accuracy for the crop types. And uh, remember that year we don't have any training data available. Therefore, the, the machine learning model actually fill the gaps to predict the crop types when we don't have any observation data in that areas. In the past many years, we have built a quite broad tech communities around the concept of machine learning, including companies that provide computing resources, commercial companies and open source communities develop tons of softwares and the programming packages, data, uh, data Based services, programming interface, IDE, and so on and so forth. There's no way to provide a comprehensive list of uh, techniques we're going to use in machine learning uh, applications. Uh, and uh, such list, even it exists, will change year to year and rapidly. So I will just scratch a very surface of this tax stacks and introduce in a few commonly used programming language and packages in machine learning. So I will start with the programming language and go into the uh, pro uh, programming libraries and packages. At the top of the list, Python is most used program language in machine learning due to its independence across platform flexibility, simplicity, and uh, the Python code is often concise and readable. It also have massive or reliable libraries or packages ready to reduce your software development time significantly. 
The second language is R. R is widely popular, uh, is very popular because it's a ability, its ability to perform mathematic and statistical calculation on big data. It's still very popular for conducting statistical analysis in many industrial. So I would not be surprised to see a data scientist to use R as their working language. And the third language is Java because Java is uh, very, uh, very popular in developing mobile apps. And uh, we can imagine how many mobile apps will take advantage of artificial intelligence. And it's a perfect match for those programmer who uh, who main job task is to building mobile apps using machine learning or AI. And uh, we also have a Julia. Julia is one of the newer language, and it's mainly targeting on computing scientific and the technical fields. And uh, it it started gaining more users of Julia as a uh, among the programmers. So in summary, uh, I think all programming languages have its uh, similarity. If you are mastered with uh, logic and the structure of one language, it's relatively easy for you to adopt it to a different program language. You just need to relearn the syntax if you have to relearn a new, new program language. But the, the backbone of each program language are similar. You just need to understand the logic and the structure of the coding. In the following slides, I will emphasize on introducing Python packages for machine learning because based on 2021 Kaggle survey among data scientists, Python based to dominate the machine learning frameworks. That's also the case for our group, uh, among all the uh, instructors, we are heavily relied on Python packages to conduct our day-to-day -day work. So we have uh, more familiarity with this language and uh, the packages associated with it. A few fun, fun fact from that uh, Kaggle survey is that uh, among those Python tools, 80% of data scientists use scikit-learn for their machine learning uh, applications. And uh, TensorFlow and Keras uh, was mostly used for building deep learning models. And XGBoost is quite popular choice if you wanted to train a gradient boosting model. I believe all of you will use some of these tools during the notebook session of this training. In the next few slides, I will go a little bit deeper into introducing each of these packages or frameworks I mentioned above. And uh, on the top of my list, scikit-learn is definitely, definitely the space knife of machine learning. It provides vast functionality to implement machine learning algorithms such as classification, uh, regression, clustering algorithm, dimensional dimensional reduction, model selection, data pre-processing, and so on and so forth. And uh, it also have a very wonderful website to provide thorough documentation to help you understand and use the, those functions. I will strongly recommend to start your journey of machine learning from scikit-learn. And the TensorFlow and the Keras, as I mentioned about, are two high-level Python frameworks to help you build and train neural network models, or somebody called them deep learning models. Besides those two packages, PyTorch is another uh, option for deep learning model. Each framework has its own advantage and disadvantage. You may choose uh, different frameworks based on your requirement of your specific tasks. Also, frameworks also pro provide plenty of examples and in instructions in their website. On this slide, I will introduce uh, some 
utility softwares surrounding machine learning. First of all, Jupyter Notebook uh, is not a, only develop, developed for machine learning, but because it's provide a web-based interactive coding environment, notebooks become a great way to build prototype or sharing your models with other colleagues or friends. We will gain a lot of hands-on experience during this training uh, with notebooks later on. And Matt, Matt Polyb and Seaborn are two visualization libraries often used by data scientists for examining their data sets and the machine learning results. In this slide, I would like to touch uh, a little bit about the graphic processing unit GPU role in machine learning. Because not all, but many machine learning algorithms can divide tasks into thousands of smaller subtasks and the process them all at the same time. For instance, most often neural networks are designed to run in parallel. Therefore, GPU has a perfect match for such tasks because GPU can have thousands of cores that can run operations in parallel on multiple data points. In this way, GPU can provide massive acceleration for machine learning, training, and predictions. There are many platforms to support parallel computing with GPUs. Out of them, CUDA, developed by NVIDIA, is the most popular one because CUDA can run on both Windows and Linux operational system and many Python libraries, such as TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, XGBoost, OpenCV, etc., can be run on NVIDIA CUDA-enabled graphic cards. So you can take advantage of the uh, high-speed computing of GPU and the training models. So now we're going to introduce some of these machine learning algorithms. And note that we're going to only introduce some of the basics and the fundamentals of these. They're going to provide you with the base then to infer from other algorithms that can be uh, being released out there. Now, one of the main questions that we normally raise is which algorithm to choose. We have many machine learning algorithms being released on a weekly basis for many applications, particularly on earth science and even on general purpose applications. The development of machine learning algorithms has just been exponentially increasing over the past few years. And many of these, they rely on foundations of models that people normally just modify for their own applications. So we will not dive into the specifics of each one of those algorithms, but we will provide the tools to aid in the selection of some of these for your earth science problem. We're gonna introduce some of the actual mathematic basics of them, but we're gonna also provide hints or highlights on how many of these algorithms can be a good fit for your own application based on specific questions. Just to be clear, you're never bounded to a single algorithm. You can choose an algorithm now and might be able to change the algorithm along the development process, but it's always good to start from a good base or from a, at least a core base that you can then start working on your way through like other applications. On the right side, we have kind of a diagram of some of these huge numbers of algorithms that we have. But note how they go from an initial branch, let's say supervised learning, but then they kind of divide into that same base for like classification or regression, where they just modify, let's say, some of the ways they approach the mechanisms of predicting the target that we're looking for. So, First thing that we need to do before choosing an algorithm is to specify the science problem. It's not a good practice to just go ahead and say, I'm gonna use machine learning for my problem without knowing how machine learning will benefit your problem or your application. So the first step that we need to do is to identify that science problem and what scientific questions we want to answer. 
From there, we can roll down through all of these steps of the machine learning workflow where we identify our data, we test and see how the performance is gonna be on our application and what performance are we required to have for this specific application. We also, we also go by and check on the explainability of our model. How much do we need to explain our model in order to trust it for a specific application? An example here is that for disasters response, you're probably not gonna be comfortable using an algorithm that is just a black box that you just, just don't understand that much. So you'll probably end up having an algorithm that you can understand its decision, decisions and drivers to avoid false positives or false neg negatives. The other concept that we need to look into play is the dimensionality of our data. What are the dimensions of, the, of our data? Do we need to reduce the dimensions of our data to find more actionable results? Do we need to look at specifics of how to do feature engineering to improve our data set in order to find some of these solutions? Okay, so now let's just dive in into some of these questions. And while I start discussing some of them, feel free to think about your specific problem in hand and how will you answer some of these based on your application. Our first question is, which scientific question would you like to address and what information is missing to answer this question? Well, the first answer to this is that in this application or in this use case during session one and two, we'll be wanting to identify the signs, the magnitude, and the potential drivers of change in surface water extent in X to the area. In our case, we're going to select X as being Lake Powell in the United States but your study area can be as small as a single site, as big as multiple sites, and then it can also be considered as temporary and spatially different. You can have a single year that you might be looking at, or you can have multiple years and dates that you're gonna be looking at when selecting the algorithm. In regards to the information that might, that might be missing, we actually need to compute and do and create surface water extent maps to quantify and analyze these drivers. So we know what is missing, we know what is missing out there from literature, and is this surface water extent maps across our temporal and then spatial domain. Once we know what is our problem and how we want to solve it, we need to look at what data do you have available? How much training data do you have available, if you have any, and then what is gonna be the data structure of your data in question? Based on the data set structure that you might have, you can go through this tree and kind of have an idea of which algorithms might be useful based on your use case. For example, let's say that we have a discrete data of let's say categorical options. Let's say that we want to identify land cover on a particular map where we go from one that is a tree, two that is crop, tree that is building or structures and so forth. If we have the data in spatial format, let's say a raster where each one of those pixels is an observation, we can go through algorithms that use spatial extent as a driver for performing those classifications. One example of those algorithms could be a convolutional neural network where we take spatial and spectral responses from our raster to then perform the classification. Now, Let's say that we only have point-wise data. We only have tabular data format where we don't have any spatial information of our data. Well, for that end, we could go for an algorithm that is not gonna care about that much about the spatial, but more about the spectral response. And some of those algorithms could be a random forest, could be an XGPOOS algorithm, where we are only looking at the column features of that observation. We are caring about the neighborhood of that pixel. Another example is on the continuous side of things. We might have a target variable that is not a categorical option, but is a kind of a regression option or a continuous value. Think about some applications like lake depth. Think about canopy height models where you want to actually identify the height of that particular pixel or that particular object. In this case, we also have the option of having data in a spatial or tabular format. If we have a spatial uh, data structure, we might be able to also leverage convolutional neural networks or even transformers to then 
increase our way of looking at both the spectral response, but also the neighboring pixels across that particular observation. This can be a way of quantifying the way we learn through the model or the way, the way we represent our actual training data. Assuming we have the data on a tabular format, we could also use another deviation of the random forage, forest, which would be a random forest regressor. We can also use things like neural networks where we only look at specific pixels and then take decisions and train a model based on that. Now, let's answer some of these questions with our use case for session one and two. The data we have available is gonna be the global coverage we have with MODIS satellite data. We're gonna be using data from the MODIS instrument. And we do have global coverage from this instrument across several temporal windows. Do we have the training data available? Well, in this case, we have gathered large extents of training data points that are gonna be quantifying the water extent over the surface. What is the data structure of these data? Well, the data structure of our data comes on a raster format, but we can actually pre-process this data and perform feature engineering to make it into a tabular format. The last piece of this, if this is a continuous or discrete problem, in our case, our dependent value is gonna be water pixels, which we are discretizing as no water and water. So we have looked at the data structure and some of the options that we have based on the algorithms, but we also need to take into account performance. And some of the questions we need to answer for performance wise is, what are the performance requirements based on the science questions we have? Do we need real time observations or do we have static maps that we're gonna create that can be then looked at later on? We also need to take into account which software we're gonna be running the application on. For example, we can have on-premise resources where we would have probably a server in our lab. We can also leverage commercial cloud like Amazon Web Services or Azure Cloud where we leverage systems that are being controlled or managed on an external cloud. We can also run applications on embedded hardware, hardware that could actually be running on a space cube or on a satellite that is on orbit. Last question that we have is, what is the most important for your project? Is it inference time or is it model performance? Is it how fast your model can provide responses or how good your model is in terms of accuracy? Based on the actual algorithms of machine learning that we have these days, there's always a way of paying attention to some of these. You might be able to have a really accurate model that might take additional time to perform inference. And this is because some of these models, they are created to be large enough to be able to discretize additional features from the data, but they are normally bigger, which means that they need to perform additional computations and discretization from the actual data. An example on this right side image that we have in here, we have simplicity over time versus the accuracy. Many of these simple algorithms like linear regression, where we're only solving for an equation, or logistic regression, they're very simple, but they also lack on most of the accuracy on data sets that are kind of complex. We also have k-means clustering algorithm where we perform unsupervised classification of specific data sets where accuracy might be limited by the simplicity and time this take to be processed or to be run. Our accuracy continues then to increase when we start looking at more complex algorithms like neural networks, decision trees, and ensembles of these, even support vector machines, but they are limited by the simplicity or the time that are gonna take. So we can get more accurate observations, let's say from a neural network, but it's gonna take longer to train and to do inference compared to some simple models like linear regressions. To answer this question based on the session one and two objectives, we have that for our first question, which is what are our performance requirements? We really don't need real-time maps of water, at least for this application. Now consider that you're doing, let's say, fire occurrence modeling, or that you're modeling fire spread to assess and to inform some of the stakeholders at the field trying to put on the fire. Well, for that particular use case, you might need real-time 
predictions or real time uh, inference of your data set, which might require a more complex algorithm that can give you both the accuracy, but also the simplicity. For where run, our model needs to run, we want our software to actually run on both on-premise and in the cloud. We want to be flexible enough to run on both places. You can invest some time to make sure that your model runs on both, but you can also concentrate on the specific application you're gonna be running on. For example, you can optimize your model to only run on-premises without having to consider on the cloud resources. The last question that we have in here is, what is more important for us, the inference time or the model performance? In our case, we actually have to have better model performance rather than inference time because we're going to be creating these maps once and then looking at them from a science perspective. So we don't need to actually create them as fast as we need them. We actually need to process the entire global coverage on a timely fashion, which we're going to leverage GPUs for it. But we don't need real-time observations like something like a satellite would need to perform decisions on. The last piece is kind of the operation side of things. How do we choose the specific model based on the data we have, but also our requirements? And scikit-learns provide a good overview of how some of these decisions would go. One example of this is we can start from, let's say, the start endpoint. And the first question that we have is, how many samples are we going to process? Do we have more than 50 samples? or do we have less than 50 samples? In some applications, let's say for the water extent mapping of the entire globe, you will need more than 50 samples to perform an accurate prediction or classification in this case. Just because of how spectral diverse the actual globe is, you're gonna have more than 50 different spectral differences or spectral responses on different locations. Let's just compare what, how a bare soil would look like compared to how the actual water would look like, compared to how a wet land field would look like. There are gonna be many spectral responses where just having 50 pixels or 50 observations is not gonna be enough. Well, once we gather more, more data, we can then proceed to select which category we're gonna be looking at. Are we gonna quantify or get a prediction of the quantification of a value? Are we have gonna have labeled data that we then need to classify into other means, what is gonna be the actual target on our use case? Well, if we're gonna have labeled data and we have less than, let's say 100,000 of samples, we can use algorithms that are not very data intensive or that do not require vast amounts of data to have at least accurate predictions. Let's say that you have less than 100,000 samples and you want to quantify something, you can also look at several regressors that can provide you with the accurate results that you might need based on the small sample that you might have. Now, let's say that you can actually have more samples than the actual application, that you can increase your training data set to be representative enough across the actual data set. Well, that's where we can start looking at maybe neural networks, maybe other ensemble algorithms that can take into account both generalization but also accuracy based on the representatives of your training data. Okay, so now we're gonna run our exercise for this particular session. To gather some of the material that you're gonna need for this exercise, you need to go to the Git repository that we just mentioned. And the address is listed on the session, but here you can access the URL for getting to the repository. And just to give a quick overview of how the repository is organized, you're gonna have a several directories that are gonna have individual materials for some of these sessions, including additional resources. that you can take a look at it after the training is done or after all of these sessions are done. The most important piece in here is gonna be this readme in here where you have access to all of the notebooks that are be, gonna be used for the session. For example, for these session one materials, you can look at them in this particular table where you have one, the actual exercise we're gonna be doing, but also the assignment that is gonna be need to turn in after this session is done. Okay, so let's gather and use our notebook. 
the way we're going to start this and run the software, instead of doing it locally on your laptop, we're going to use the free resources from Google Code Laboratory. And for this, you're going to need an actual Google account to access it. Once we click on that button, we can actually access our notebook that we can and then start executing across the way. One of the, uh, let's say, benefits from Google Colab is that you can have both text, but also software being run in the same location. This is basically a Jupyter notebook just embedded on additional hardware. Another benefit from Google Colab is that you can leverage free resources and even take some GPU time to do some of your work. So if you need to have, let's say, low level applications or even like exploratory data analysis just to take a look at your data you can leverage some of these resources for free some of the important pieces in here you have the file tab where you can open new net new notebooks or create new notebooks you can edit some of the cells that you have in there like pasting and cutting some of these cells that we're going to be working with but the most important and the one we want to focus on for this session is the runtime so not only runtime where we have options to run all, which would be running every single cell on our session, or run before or run the selection cell that we have. If we go straight to each one of these of these cells, you're gonna see that there is a play button at the left side of the cell. That means that you're gonna run that particular cell and it's gonna do something. So let's just start from scratch and clean up all of these actions. We can go and then play bot, like the play button. We're gonna have that option of says, warning this notebook was not authored by Google, but it's actually authored by us. So just click on run anyway, and that is gonna actually execute that cell that you have in there. This first option is a wget command. We normally use this command to download any files that we might be missing from public repositories. If you have any URL or a file that you want to load into your session, you can always paste the URL after the wget option to have it available on your session. If you look at the directory files in here, you can see that the actual file was downloaded and we're gonna be using that for later, pur later purposes. If you have any dependencies that you might need for your own application, you can then click on that particular cell and you're gonna be then installing some of those dependencies on the fly. By default, this Google Code that has a Python environment that has most of the applications or machine learning libraries that you're gonna need for specific applications. That being said, let's dive in into some of the material from this session. In who we're gonna first familiarize with the Google Code environment, which we have been doing so far, but we want to also familiarize ourselves with some of the machine learning software libraries and how to look at some of these problems. In this first section, we're importing some of the Python packages that we're gonna need. Know that we have some general data science packages like NumPy to deal with arrays and also Pandas to deal with data frames. But we also have some geospatial packages like RioX Array and GDAL to work with some of those geospatial data structures that we might need. Last but not least, we also include some of the actual libraries that we're gonna use for our software which in this case would be scikit-learn and then this specific model that you would be using. For example, this would be how to call a random forest classifier. The structure of this particular notebook, we're gonna kind of follow on on the questions that we were answering on the first session of these slides, but we're gonna be looking at how to think about them through the actual exercise. So for example, we know now that we need surface water extent maps to quantify and analyze the drivers of change in let's say the global MODIS data set. We have access to the MODIS data, so we're not limited in regards to the data we have. Now we need to think about how we want to approach our problem. And there are many ways to think about it, because we can just go through some of these questions. Well, first one is our problem classification or a regression problem. Based on that answer, you can think about what actual model or what actual algorithm to use. And we already discussed that if we're gonna do a simple classification, we might be able to use a random forest classifier 
if we're going to do any regression or quantifiable values, then we can use a random forest regressor. And that same concept of the actual algorithm and the actual application are going to be used across the board. For example, there can be a logistic regressor and so forth. Now, our next question is, we know that we have a classification problem. Now, how many classes are we going to have in this problem? You can have a binary problem where we can just identify water and not water pixels, but we can also quantify, let's say, multiple classes within a, an individual class. Let's say that we want to differentiate between like open waters, rivers, oceans, etc. Depending on that particular problem, you can have a binary algorithm or you can have a multi-class algorithm. Now, we know how we're going to approach the problem. We know we want a classifier that is going to then be doing binary segmentation or binary classification. There is always the main question of, do we have training data? Do we have labels that can provide the insights to the machine learning algorithm of how much, uh, how well we're going to predict on, uh, let's say, given new data into the model? Well, for example, the random forest might not need as many observations as what a like convolutional neural network model would need. Because the amount of training data available is going to play a big role at the time of selecting which algorithm to choose. We can also use feature engineering techniques as adding new features and so forth to increase the amount of data we have. Like, for example, using data augmentation techniques, where we do small deviations of existing training data points to increase the amount of data we have. Now, some of the questions that you need to do before performing any feature engineering is, is our training data of good quality? And the quality of your data is gonna, gonna be a huge driver at when deciding which training data set to use. For example, disaster, disaster responding applications might not be flexible enough to have mislabeled data in the training, since it might bring additional noise to their models. However, when dealing with other types of simple classifications, we might be able to consolidate or even uh, be okay with some mislabeled data that we can then maybe downside on our actual training data set. Thus, the quality of the labeling data is going to be really a factor to account for, depending on your application. Now, is there any da label labeling data available out there? Like, are there any crowdsource labels that you might be able to leverage into your problem? Can you use labels that other people have created for your own application? Let's say that you have labels, someone created at two meter resolution, and you need those labels at 10 meter. Well, you might be able to upsample your observations to then get them into the grid that you might need for your own application. The last question that we have, and which is really important depending on the problem is, how much budget do you have to invest in training data? Maybe your project didn't have any budget to invest on creating training data because it just takes time. It takes money to actually get the training data, get the observers to quantify some of these. Or you might need to then use some unsupervised methods to try to account for the lack of training data. One technique that you can use for, let's say, doing unsupervised labeling of data is using clustering algorithms. And here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce one of them, which is the k-means clustering algorithm. But it's basically the foundation for all the clustering algorithms that are similarly out there. The main idea of clustering algorithms is that we provide a k number of clusters that we're going to be dividing our data into. And where all of the other algorithms kind of differentiate from k-means is how they calculate distance between our groups, how they calculate the centroids that we're going to be clustering our data into. The main idea here is that we're going to have, let's say, a bucket of points of our data that the algorithm is going to, one, look at it, two, calculate centroids of distance across them, and then randomly initiate some of these clusters across the data. This can provide, based on the data set, good options to visualize or to even segregate some of the observations. We might even be able to identify outliers in our data set that can help us understand how our data is looking like for the specific application. Even taking it further, we can observe how we can perform some k-means clustering simply by using the scikit-learn library. For example, we here select the number of clusters that we want to do. We then 
take and download specific bands from our raster. And then we go ahead and perform a fit operation of our data set, which in this case is allowing the model to learn or to iterate across the data. Once we have fitted our algorithm, we can then proceed to perform any predictions. And then since we were using the data as a tabular format, we can just reshape it back into our raster data. An example is in here where we have one, the imagery that was input to the k-means cluster, and also the output of that k-means cluster, which in this case are a group of four clusters across the raster. If we look into more detail across it, we can see how these four groups are being classified in this cluster. Note that there's extremely a lot of noise and the lake in here that is in the middle, which is Lake Powell, is not really well segmented through k-means. Now, one of those masks actually gather all of the pixels from Lake Powell into a single cluster. The downside of this is that we also have noise from other features that were not water pixels. That being says, said, this can be a good start for creating the labeling points. Now, instead of having to manually label each one of the pixels from Lake Powell, you can use this as a starting point and then disaggregate some of these clusters to then create, let's say, the crown truth map that you might need to train other models that might be on a supervised fashion. Okay, so now let's just discuss some of these uh, algorithms and at least some of the basics. The first one that we have is the random forest. And the basics of random forest is that we have n observations and we have a target variable that we want to match based on those observations. The idea is that we're gonna create independent trees that are gonna be then aggregated at the end and we're gonna get or a majority score or the average of those independent trees. The idea of how these independent trees are aggregated is that we do a bootstrapping technique, which is basically creating additional training data sets from the initial, let's say, training data set that we provide the model. So we have multiple observations that we're gonna be, be then creating independent trees, and each one of those trees are gonna gather a particular decision. At the end, the trees that have the majority or the majority rule is applied to all of the trees, and we get the classification or the regression value that we want. One of the downsides of random forest is that generally they don't generalize very well because they need to use or they need to have decisions that are supported by individual features. If your feature engineering process was not good enough, then your models might not be able to generalize across different samples that the model hasn't seen. Here we present a simple way of applying a random forest classifier, and we're gonna deep dive a bit more on other sessions. So next we have the XGBoost. The XGBoost XG takes the ensemble or three ensemble as the random forest to the next level. In here, instead of taking each one of the trees as a single observation, each one of them weighted at the same way, in this case, we prioritize the trees or the observations where our ensemble failed on, the trees and observations that need or require additional training on. And the idea is that we use a minim minimization function where we kind of penalize our model based on observations that we're missing. So we do have the same option of having multiple trees, but then the way we approach retraining the trees is based on a weighted um, function where we take gradient descent calculation to improve on this. And the basic of gradient descent is that is basically just a strategy of minimizing that cost function or minimizing that error between the predicted values from those trees by doing many iterations on the data. Another nice thing about this compared to the random forest is that we can use what are called regularization techniques across the XGBoost. So we can try to avoid overfitting by penalizing the model when we see that it's actually overfitting in some of these observations. A simple example of how to implement the XGBoost is also in here. And know that the basic approach is the same. We have three operations that we need to do where we fit the model and then perform the predictions, very similarly to the other two that we already discussed. 
Another application or another algorithms are the neural networks. And in this case, we are kind of moving towards a more complex algorithm that then requires more training data to work from. And the main idea here is that we use, instead of decision trees or instead of like a structured decision, we allow our model or algorithm to learn features out of the data. So instead of spending a lot of time in the feature engineering process to differentiate representative training from other non-representative training and find generalization, in this case, we're actually allowing the model to learn the patterns by itself. And this is done by a process of forward propagation and back propagation. And the idea is that the model, let's say, penalizes each one of these you know, locations or decisions that the model is doing and then it relearns what is happening or the features that are being misclassified and goes again and iterates over the process on and on and on and the idea here is that we're going to be mimicking let's say the human brain by having multiple neurons that are extremely connected and based on weight or based on values that we have on each neuron we're going to be able to then click on and off for each one of the patterns or each one of the features that we're, we're going to be learning from. Below this, we also have kind of an example of how to implement some of this. And know that this is basically the same approach that we had before, just by adding one more step, which in this case would be the compilation. And again, we don't dive into many details in here, but this can provide you with the base to think about your problem and then go from there. The three algorithms that we just mentioned, they're basically pixel-based algorithms or algorithms that didn't take into account the neighborhood of those pixels. For that, we have convolutional neural networks. And the main idea of convolutional neural networks is basically having also the neuron approach where each one of those neurons are connected, but we include the convolution piece into the model. And the idea of convolutions is that we're going to both take the spectral response or the value of that individual pixel, but we are also going to calculate values across the neighborhood of that pixel to take into account the spatial characteristics of it. And this is really useful, let's say, for applications where you actually care about the neighborhood of the individual pixel in order to get the prediction of it. Let's say, for example, you want to classify if a tree is actually a tree or not, you might be able to hit on a, let's say, the middle point of the crown but a CNN would allow you to learn that it's a tree by looking at that individual crown pixel, but also its boundaries. Okay, so as some closing thoughts, we have introduced some of the basics of these algorithms. We have provided some of the foundations of how to look for characteristics in these individual algorithms and how they play a role when deciding which one to use. We have also discussed some of the basics of looking at the data and understanding the data in order to choose the actual algorithm. And we have also discussed on some of the techniques to better choose the initial algorithm without having to stick with that specific algorithm across the development process and making it clear that you can start with a single algorithm, but you can also change the same algorithm by simply doing some simple code changes. Thank you very much for listening in. Just a couple of remarks. Uh, remember that you have an assignment for this week. Please make sure to look at it. You're gonna, if you go to the actual Git rep repository, you're gonna see that there is assignment section one. Click on the open Google Colab option and follow the instructions from the assignment. And you're just gonna be pointed out some questions uh, after the assignment to get more experience and, and practice as, across the, the topic we include in here. So now, uh, Brock, please free, feel free to continue on. Thank you very much, Jordan. Before we open it up to address your questions, let's review what we did here today. Through the overview of machine learning, we were able to identify the importance and utility of machine learning targeted towards earth science. We covered software to support machine learning, machine learning applications, and ended with a hands-on Jupyter notebook exercises or an exercise showing how to load and visualize that data. We hope that after this part one, you are able to recognize the most common machine learning methods used for processing earth science data, describe the benefits and limitations, 
um, and then explain how to apply the basic machine learning algorithms and techniques in a meaningful manner. Looking ahead to part two next week, we'll be covering training data and a land cover classification example. We'll do this by downloading and exploring training data, extracting that training data, model evaluation, and another Jupyter Notebook exercise on a MODIS water classification case study. So look forward to that next week. If you have any further questions, you can contact myself or my RSEC colleagues at our email addresses here. As a reminder, here is a course website where you can find all the materials, including the PDF of the PowerPoint presentation and the recording of the video that will be uploaded shortly. The homework link can be avail will be available on the course website during the final session, so or the final part on May 4th. And I have also included our primary RSET website. We can check out all the great trainings and follow us on Twitter for exciting announcement, announcements from NASA's Earth Sciences. So now we'll enter into the question and answer period. Please enter your question in the question box. We'll answer them in the order that they were received. As a reminder, all questions asked previously have been moved over to this Q&A document, and we'll provide that as a PDF on the training webpage within about a week for you to download. Thank you. Okay, we will open up our question and answer session now. Thank you for sending in your questions and please keep them coming. So, we have been moving these over throughout the presentation, and um, we'll start addressing these one by one. I'm just gonna make this a little bit bigger for everybody. Okay, all right, so uh, I'll just start with question one. What counts as very large, large numbers? And I believe this was part of the presentation that Gian was giving. Uh, what counts as very large numbers for the comments about R versus Python? Millions, billions, or trillions? I'm not sure if Jordan or Gian, you wanted to uh, address this. You can unmute your mic. Sure, actually by very large number, I mean mathematically, mathematically large. For instance, R provide a package called GMP that can help to calculate the uh, simple equation like if n equals ten to the two two hundred and fifty, then what what if the n square will be? Uh, instead of return infinity, R with GMP can provide the correct answer of ten to the five hundred. Uh, this is just like a minor advantage. Uh, the most important strength or advantage of R is its capability of building statistic model. And that's why many people still choosing R as their machine learning tool, because most of machine learning uh, algorithms are, are basically statistics. And there are uh, provide vast packages, vast amount of packages for statistic computing. That's uh, that's the main attractive uh, attractive points of our language. Thank you. Yeah, and that last point, very important. Thank you. Question two, are there any case studies where a hybrid method is used? Um, are data-driven and model, are data-driven and model drives applied at the same time? And at which level can we use each one in the same process. Uh, it looks like we have some answers here. Uh, whoever feels comfortable speaking to this or filled in most of it, please feel free. I can probably speak on that. Um, so there are actually many cases where you can use kind of a hybrid method between model-driven and data-driven uh, obligations. And some of these techniques are actually called physics-informed models or knowledge-informed models in machine learning. And the idea is that you have cases where you have your data-driven model that can be informed by some equations from the physics side of things. Um, you can also have applications where the data-driven models are used, used for one task, and then your model-driven model is kind of like used for a downstream task, and, and even vice versa. You can start with one and then and your workflow with another. Um, there are actually 
kind of no specifics on where to use one over the other. So my recommendation would be like, if you have the data available to train the data-driven model, you can always rely on it and then validate with some of the model-driven data. Most of this machine learning based model, they, they will be, they'll have better performance, it'll be faster uh, than some of these model-driven, but it can also be um, kind of the other way depending on your task. Uh, another thing is that you could accelerate some of these synthetic train, de train data generation um, by using some of these model driven to generate some of these synthetic train data. And then there are also some use cases where people use machine learning methods to kind of do feature selection or parameter tuning on those um, data driven models. So it's kind of taking the, the advantage of kind of the potential speed of machine learning to then boost some of those model driven or physics based models. Um, we added one reference there that you can kind of look out later. Yes, thank you very much for that reference. And I, I pointed or I put that link in the chat so people can have that. We'll also uh, have this available on the training web page in about a week. Uh, question three, how is the trade-off between speed and accuracy determined for the model shown in figure slide 36? How do you define accuracy here? So slide 36 was kind of a simplicit, sim, simply, simple approach to kind of defining that trade-off. And accuracy can be any metric on your end. And this is something that is really like use case, um, on a use case basis. But the idea is that accuracy would be kind of that equation or that um, metric that you want your model to improve on or to kind of be better on. And like accuracy can be either just plain accuracy or kind of the average approach. It can be precision, it can be even recall. Um, it can be a metric of your own just trying to minimize that loss error. Um, but then that trade-off between speed and accuracy is gonna depend on how many observations you need per second or how many, um, let's say, uh, how many things you need process on X number of time. And many of these simple algorithms like logistic regression, they're really fast. But normally they just don't generalize on data they haven't seen, they haven't seen before. Um, so that's kind of where the the trade off is at. Thank you. And question four: Can we use the random forest model to find crop water use? I'll I'll take that one. Um, so basically, I mean, if you have a if you have something you want to predict, if you have training for that. If you have label training for that, then in theory, you can try to train a model to predict it using some set of uh, input predictors. Uh, the skill at which you'll be able to predict, you know, crop water use, for example, is going to depend on the quality of your training labels and the the ability of the the predictor stack to tell you, you know, to predict that particular feature. In this case, crop water use. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, and that is a, a good point to, to to make there that these models they they do their function, but it really is how, what how are you defining your problem? And if you have all the the right data going in, uh, in theory, should should be uh, useful for that. Um, mm -hmm. Question exactly. five. Oh, but how do you choose the number of clusters? Um, I'll take a stab at that one too. I'm assuming they're talking about k-means clusters here, and it really depends on your question. So you can have, you know, that there is an upper limit on how many you can uh, you can set based on the the software. Thank you. And uh, part or question six: Could you please explain how k-means is supervised? I can just speak to that one then. Um, so k-means is is not dependent on any labels. You can input your data into the algorithm, and you're gonna get kind of a distant metric from that specific data. So it's gonna be looking at what features from your data are similar and then which what features are kind of like different or, or even outliers. 
that have been going to be cl clusterized in other locations. So you don't need any training data to perform these k-means clustering. And you can even use it for like some classification task. Great, thank you. Question seven, why does random forest not work well when doing a cross-validation? So I'm not sure if I understood that question uh, correctly, but I'm just going to try to aim for it. Um, Cross-validation is a second step that is done, let's say, during training or even trying to do some of the validation of your model to see how it can generalize across multiple sets of training data. So random forest can be used with cross-validation, and some of those techniques can be even like k-fold cross-validation, which we're going to discuss on the session two. Um, so it's not that it doesn't work with cross-validation, it just has some, let's say, downsides where it is only going to be able to kind of classify or perform well on data that it has seen, or at least representative training. So it might not be able to generalize very well on other things just because features that it's learning are based on the training data that you input. Um, Thank you. No, I, I think that that hopefully got to the heart of uh, what this participant was asking. But please pay attention to part two next week where uh, we're going to go a little bit deeper into that. Question eight, when we use algorithms such as random forest or tree decision, we have different inputs for the model. Is it advisable to do a preliminary analysis to avoid collinearity? Or is the algorithm able to manage that? I'm going to take a stab at that one as well. So it's always good to not even, you might not need to go into collinearity that much, but at least do exploratory data analysis of how your data looks like and then how are your features aligned based on the features that you're trying to find or that you're trying to um, classify. Um, the idea here is that with exploratory data analysis, which we're also going to discuss in session two, you can find what features from your data are similar enough to know how the model is going to respond or how the model is going to be learning from those features. So we do advise always to do exploratory data analysis, one, for yourself to kind of understand how your data looks like and to see if there are any like correlations between the data, but two, also to kind of have a heads up of how the model is going to be learning the features from your data. Thank you very much. Okay, question nine. We have a three-parter. Here I have three questions. What are the possible solutions if the number of samples of the classified class is unequal to what is the overfitting problem? I don't know if you just want to attach uh, attack the first couple parts of this one. Okay, there, there are several ways of attacking some of these problems. So i you going to briefly start talking about number nine. Uh, so number of samples is unequal. So there are many ways of doing this. First of all is you can try to drop some of your features from the data, let's say of the class that you have the most, and then make like try to make a balance between them. And this would be fine for some of these like tabular algorithms like random forest or XGBoost. You can also try to increase the number of features you have from your unrepresented uh, class or data by just increasing the number of like, uh, observations you have by like just like doing synthetic um, data creation or even like doing data augmentation to increase the number of features. There is another solution for other like more complicated methods like neural networks where you can use a loss function or the function that is going to penalize your model while learning to then account for that class imbalance as well. So there are, there are many techniques. We can just append some references to these questions just to like so you can look at look at them later. Um, and we're going to probably discuss some of those on session two as well. Thank you. Question 10, do you have any additional machine learning references that would be helpful to read or use, particularly in the wide variety of algorithms and their uses? And it looks like we have a couple. We have a uh, Coursera course, which is open. 
long as you and I'll put that in the chat. Uh, we also have a couple of books. We will add some more to this as we come up with them. But for now, I'm just kind of placing these in the chat and uh, look for these links to be available to you uh, when we post this to the training web page. Okay, question 11. When I try to change the runtime type, the hardware accelerator is already set to GPU and the GPU class is standard. Is that correct? Does that sound? Yes, and this is regarding assignment one in the session that is in there. Yes, what you want to have is that particular option. You don't need to purchase any premium GPUs. All you need to do is change your runtime type to have the GPU. If your, your runtime type is already on GPU, then that's fine. You can just proceed to run some of these cells and make sure to kind of follow some of the instructions that are above these cells, because you're going to need to do kind of press play on some cells before you can just proceed with the entirety of the exercise. Great, thank you. And I hope everybody has uh, had a chance to access the, the link to the GitHub that also takes you to all the notebooks. Uh, we have that on the training webpage and we've been placing that in the chat. So you have, it's also included in the presentation itself. Question 12, what do you think are the downsides of machine learning as regards to dry, as regards to land change science, knowing that natural and anthropogenic activities are dynamic? More of a theoretical type of. Yeah, that is an interesting question. So many of the downsides of machine learning are based on what data do we have available. And the model is going to be probably as good as the data that you actually provide. And it's going to try to infer or extract features out of the data. But sometimes the features that it, it extracts are just like too simple to kind of model the actual anthropogenic activities or even like the dynamic realm of our atmosphere, or even Earth. So I think that the, the biggest downside is going to be how much data or how representative data we can input or model with so you can learn those kind of different characteristics or, or different aspects of what we're trying to model um, in our model. Yeah. Okay, we have a couple minutes left. So I think we might just take this question number 13 um, and close it out for today. Um, however, we have been collecting your questions and uh, we will do our best to address these before we post to our training web page. Question 13, I'm trying to work with atmospheric phenomenon forecasts and predictions. What should guide my choice of training data, reanalysis data or forecasts of numerical weather prediction models? Okay, so that guidance and um, your choice of data is gonna depend both on your temporal resolution, but also on your spatial resolution. So it would actually depend on how temporal specific and how um, spatial specific your model is going to be to then select that training data. For example, um, I've seen some forecasting models that would rely on some synthetic data generated from like the weather forecasting model. And those models are going to kind of depend on some of the NOAA GFS models that uh, do some of the forecasting. And some of those are like one, one kilometer or like half degree resolution at the most. Uh, so whatever training they are looking for is going to depend also on your area of study. There are some uh, studies of how biased some of these models are depending on the actual study area you're concentrating on. So if this is globally related, you're, you're going to need to look at what are the bias of this existing um, training data sets that are out there um, to see how specific it would be or how, um, how much, how, what is going to be the quality of the training that you're going to be looking for. Uh, the also, the other part of your question is, can we also take real-time observations available for a short period of time? And, and that is, of course. Um, you can also have um, training data that is going to be um, close to real-time just to do some of the forecasting. You can go from like minutes to hours to even like do 10-day forecast just by choosing whatever um, temporal resolution you're going to need for your specific use case. And then I can add one sentence for that re real-time observation for validation. Please keep in mind that even the real-time observation is not fully true. There's still uncertainty located in the real-time observations. 
uh, it, if it's on ground observations, there's uh, human induced errors. If it's remote sensing, maybe we have uh, a retrieval uh, errors occur when we processing the remote sensing data. So keep in mind that real time observation is not fully true. Great, thank you. Okay, so we are going to close this out for today. I thank you everybody for uh, attending. We are going to pick this back up next week for part two. Please take a look at the uh, the code, and the notebooks, and the uh, the assignment that's in the in the GitHub. And those assignment questions, use those to think about the uh, the, the code and explore it. Um, we will have a Google form available at the end of the training on May 4th um, that will contain these questions in for you to submit your answers, uh, which will lead to uh, a certificate of completion, which is attending all three trainings, all three parts, of course, and uh, submitting the training uh, homework. So with that, um, I just want to leave it to Jordan or Mark or Jules or Gian, if you have anything that you wanted to say to the participants here today, please feel free. No, just thank you very much for attending and hopefully we do some more exciting things on session two and three. We certainly will. Okay, uh, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. <laughs>